So we're going to continue Tehillim, Psalms, chapter Ein Bet, 72. This is not a very long chapter, and it's a very different kind of chapter. It deals with Shalomo, his son, the son of David, Solomon, and also he discusses or describes the era of Mashiach, how things will be so magnificent, things will be very, very different, and uh, something that we are looking forward to. So there's a little bit of a description of how things will be there when Mashiach comes. The sigula of this perek, the special powers that this chapter has for one to recite, is to find favor in Tzokhen, to find favor and grace in the eyes of others for people to like him. And also, if one is having a hard time financially, this is also a powerful perek to say on a regular basis. As I've said it before, every perek has a different unique segula, remedy or power that can be helpful. Even though some do say Tehillim on a regular basis, which is very good, it's very powerful, some perakim, some chapters are unique and special for something in particular. So this one is to find hen, to find favor in people's eyes, whether it's a judge or someone that you need him to look nicely, kindly at you. So as you can tell right away, he mentions the name Shalomo for Solomon. He asks God, impart your justice to the king and your righteousness to the son of the king. So who is he talking about? The king and the son of the king? Well, the simple translation is to the same person, but he's talking about two different ideas over here. First, he's asking that Hashem give chokhmah, give wisdom to Shalomo Melech, which is, by the way, something that Shalomo himself asked in order to succeed in life, in order to succeed as a king. You want wisdom. That's uh, the most important asset that you can have. You can't always rely on your advisors. It's politics. So you want the wisdom of Hashem to guide you and to judge people fairly and properly. Not to be misled, but to see the truth, to be able to see through false witnesses. Not everyone can see through the lies and uh, the corruption that is out there. So, special prayer that David Melech composed here. Towards the end of his life, he knows that Shalom Melech is going to be the king. And he's asking that Hashem give him that chokhmah. For what purpose? Mishpatecha lemelech ten. That he should be able to carry out justice properly. According to the rules, according to the halachot of the Torah. And sometimes, as you know, there may not be witnesses. There's no evidence in how you're supposed to decide. And the example that the rabbis use for this is the famous story with the two zonot two women who had a child, and one of them died in the middle of the night, and each woman, since they were sleeping next to each other, claimed, this living baby is mine, and yours is the dead one. And somehow he had to figure it out, and he did. And this is all because Hashem granted him the chokhmah, the wisdom to be able to figure things out. And to do so, mishpatecha, according to the laws of the Torah. And he's asking for vitzit katecha, and your righteousness should be for the son of the king. Why the son of the king? He's the king. No, because sometimes it's because of the father's fault. Maybe he may have done something that may stand in the way of his son. He does not want that this should happen, that he should, you know, in any way interfere with the success of his son, with the future of his son. So he's asking for Hashem's righteousness to help his son as a result of him being the son of a king, in other words, his own son, that his son, Shabbat Hashem, that will succeed without any interference from the father. Now, when I talk about interference, 
a lot of people may not understand what kind of interference is this? What could happen to a king? The best way to, to understand this is if you read the history of the kings of Israel. And you will see some died very young. Some were assassinated. Some were killed at war. There are many things that can go wrong. There's others who are jealous, others who want to take power away from you. All kinds of interferences that can happen, even with a powerful king. You think he's powerful, that means nothing will interfere, nothing will get in his way. Let's say everybody likes him. Well, that's good, but what about his enemies, who are not his citizens? You know, some kings had to contend with war, battles, from the neighbors, enemies, all the time. And as you will soon see, Shalom Melech was one of the exceptions. During his lifetime, peace and quiet and prosperity as well, like there never was at any other time in Jewish history. And of course, David Melech is asking for that, that Shalom Melech is a good man, he's a righteous man, but give him the wisdom. And even despite it all, he still made mistakes, right? But at the very least, things conducted themselves in a proper manner. The Bet HaMikdash was built, the temple was finally built. And the Jewish nation was at their height during the time of Shalom Olenech. Yadin Amecha Betzedek Ve'aniyecha Bemishpat. So I just want to remind you that some of what he says also applies to the Mashiach. Even though he's asking for his son, as you will see, in, especially in the latter part of the chapter, much of what he's saying is referring to the Mashiach. So he will judge. He will judge your people with righteousness. It's Tzedek. and your poor with justice. What kind of a request is that? Well, first of all, if we're talking about Mashiach, he's telling us that that's what will happen in the very few in the very near future, hopefully, that justice will be restored, something that has been missing, because we don't see it everywhere. There's a lot of injustice. So one of the descriptions of the era of Mashiach is justice will be restored. And Shlomo Melech, by granting him the wisdom, will have also that ability to carry out justice and be a kind and noble king who will not be looking out for himself, but will really care about the people and judge them in a proper way. So he's asking for Hashem's help in this matter, that Shlomo, his son, if, if this is referring to Shlomo, should be successful in this respect. Why is that so important that he mentions that there should be justice during Shlomo Melech's time, that the king should be successful in this regard? Because the rabbis tell us that the world stands aladim valaemet shalom. The world survives on three pillars. If one of them is missing, the world is in chaos. And they are justice, truth, and peace. There's no peace but war. There's no justice but corruption. No system of law and order. There's anarchy. So this is not only important for the world, we have a tradition, a very clear tradition from the Torah, that if the judges misjudge a case, Hashem has to get involved to correct it. So, so long as we do everything right, so long as the judges are acting properly and not being bribed in our carrying out justice, then Hashem does not have to do anything to correct the mistakes of human beings. But if they don't do things right, if they accept the bribes and they twist the, the law and they simply go against the rules, established rules, then Hashem has to do something. And when Hashem carries out justice, it can be very destructive. Nations have collapsed, empires have collapsed, and kings have lost their reign or have been killed as a result of not conducting themselves properly. Things just don't happen by chance. If somebody was really kind and good and did his best 
to promote the welfare of his constituents, then hopefully God assisted him and he lived for a long time and people liked him and there was prosperity. But imagine if things are not right, terribly wrong, corruption, uh, etc. Then there could be all kinds of calamities and disease and suffering and the kingdom may not last. Just look back at history, world history, and you will see one empire lasting for a while, then falling. Whether it was the Egyptians, whether it was the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. I mean, just, they, they don't last. Spain and Portugal were empires. Big empires. And today, they're poor countries, at least compared to what they were in the past. What happened? Think about it. You know what Portugal was? What Spain was? Mighty empires. What went wrong? You know, obviously most people don't ask these questions, don't analyze the history. And they just think, well, basically, whatever goes up needs to come down. <laughs> Maybe that's the, the quickest answer. <laughs> but that's not so. It shouldn't be. If Hashem approves of them, if Hashem is happy with them, they should never have come down. But all the empires eventually do come down, and the empire of Hashem is the only one that will last. And that will be when Mashiach comes. Yisru harim shalom la'am u'gva'ot b'tzedakah. That's the next verse, verse 3. May the mountains bear peace to the nation, also the hills, in the word of their righteousness. This is more or less a description of the prosperity that will abound if in fact there will be din, there will be justice in the world. And the Torah tells us, us the Torah tells us this in different words. If you follow my statutes, Hashem says, there will be rain, you will prosper, there will be no war. So this is a, a similar idea, that as a result of everything functioning right in society, in other words, everything is with justice, and it's fair, and there's no corruption, then that particular nation, that country, will, spro will, proper, will prosper and there will be peace and not war. No nation will attack it, no nation will, will rob it. Look through history, you will see how the more powerful nations subdued others and forced them to pay tribute, taxes. Why? Why should one nation be a slave of the other? Just do your own thing and leave us alone. Obviously, this is all Mishadmai. That one nation can have or can gain control over another. So that's why it gives an example here or a description that the, the mountains and the hills, meaning that there will be prosperity and the crop will be bountiful. There will be rain, there will be enough food, no, not famine. You know, today, sometimes we, are, we hear in the news that there's been a number of years of very little rain and there's drought. That happens for a reason. Or storms, which is the exact opposite. Too much rain. It's not for just any, no reason. It happens for, some, for something. Something is wrong. And the rabbis tell us it's because if human beings break the laws, then nature breaks its laws. It's a way for us to to understand that there's something wrong. It was nature, or Hashem, really through nature, signals us something is not right. You're driving and, and all of a sudden a sensor turns on. Check engine. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, <laughs> thank God that there's a sensor warning you, you know, look into this. It could be dangerous, maybe it's not so dangerous, but you have to look into it. And what if somebody has chest pains? That's the way the body is letting know the individual, go for a checkout. There's something wrong. And uh, if there's no signal, and something's terribly wrong, then the person can just collapse and die. So it's a good <coughs> thing that there are ways to notify us, you know, that something needs to be looked at. So it's not because the w weather is just changing, and as a result of that, 
you know, global warming and all these causes that even though they may be partially true, even though partially, I mean, obviously human beings are responsible for ecological disasters, spillage of oil in the ocean and the like. Yes, yes, to an extent, human beings are responsible. But on a bigger scale, it's from Shammai. You know, it's, it's all from, from heaven. This is a very important pasuk, pasuk Dalit number four. That the judge, whether we're talking about Shalom Melech or Mashiach, may he judge the nation's poor, save the children of the destitute, and crush the oppressor. Well, why not? Why shouldn't he do? Well, a lot of kings and a lot of presidents and a lot of leaders, tyrants despots are more interested in their survival. They think of themselves. They've robbed the country's riches and taken it with them after they've left. And you wonder why is this country so poor if it has so many natural resources? And there are various countries in the world like that that are very, very blessed. But where's all the money? It's not being distributed properly. And maybe the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. A very, very small middle class. And you can see it all over the world. There are various examples of countries like that. And you wonder why. Part of the problem is, of course, mismanagement. But it's deeper than that. The politicians, the leaders are corrupt. You know, and I'm sometimes very naive. Because I think that Maybe there are some prime ministers who are really good and presidents who are really kind and generous and really want to give their heart and do everything to help their citizens. But I'm told there are, there are not that many people like that. And I say, really? Why not? Because that's the way many human beings are. They think of themselves. They want to be reelected. They want to come out rich. They want to stay in power. Power corrupts. So even though someone may have been okay before he came to power, the power corrupts. So to stay faithful to one's promises and to commit to doing for the, for the poor, for those who are really suffering, it takes more than just a good heart. It takes a certain belief that this is the right thing to do. And there were some kings that are recorded in Jewish history who really thought about the poor, even though they were emptying the treasures, the treasure house. And their family, their relatives, were complaining. And what are you doing by feeding the poor? Save for yourself. Save for, for the monarchy. And the answer was, yes, I'm putting it in a safe place upstairs. All the money that I'm giving for tzedakah and helping, that is being stored away. In other words, the reward, the merits for doing that is in a place where no one can touch. The money that we have here, people can take it away. It may not last. That which we have done good, the tzedakah that we have done, that is the best investment. But who understands it that way? Who thinks like that? So he's talking about a king, whether it's Shalomu Melech or the Mashiach, who will care about the poor and the destitute. And he will crush the oppressor. In other words, he will have complete control over the situation because it's, perhaps somebody will want to stop him from doing that. Oppressors, people who are, you know, just interested in, in abusing others to their advantage. And he will not tolerate it. In many countries throughout history, you will see that a friend brings a friend. They take care of their own families their own friends, they don't care about the rest of them. So this will stop. When Mashiach comes, you will no longer see that kind of uh, system that is rotten from the, from the bottom up. Shalom Melech was like that. He did care. He amassed a, a great amount of wealth, but it wasn't for himself. He used it for the people, and no one was lacking during his time. People were happy. 
and there was so much wealth that the Pasuk describes that even the rocks were made of silver. It was, he used his, his wealth in, in ways that benefited the people, not just himself. Another idea of why this is significant in uh, taking care of the poor, and judging them, and figuring out what their needs are, is because the poor people, who can they turn to? It says in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Avi Yetomim V'dayan Almanot. He's the father of the orphans. He's the judge of the widows because there's no one else that will take care of them. And if they cry out, it is very sensitive. Hashem listens to their cry because they have no one. So one has to be very careful that there should be no accusation against him because he was so callous and indifferent to the plight of the poor. And the king being that he's in a position to help more than anybody else, or if it's the leader, a rabbi of a community, and he can do something about a situation and he does not, he gets the blame. I'll share with you a story that took place during the time of Dari, we're talking about 450 years ago approximately. This is in the city of Tzfat, where all of a sudden the Ari, Rabbi Yitzhak Lulia, was studying with his students and he saw a black cloud approaching, and he understood what that meant. That the city was in for trouble, great trouble, because there is a poor man that nobody's aware of, who's crying to God, complaining about his situation, that he has no help. And no one, no one cares, and no one has taken care of him. So this great rabbi, of course, who became aware of this, immediately sent some of his students to help this poor man and to advise him, please, from now on, don't cry to Hashem, because this brings about an accusation against the community, against the people living in the city. Instead, bring it to our attention. Obviously, some people are embarrassed, you know, they don't want to do that, but don't cry, don't complain. Because what you were doing was you were bringing about an accusation against the entire city. We were in big trouble. And sure enough, because the, at the last moment the rabbi sent the help that this poor man needed, the, the gezerah, the terrible decree against the city, was canceled. So this is what we're talking about here, that those who are aware of situations where they can be of help, they need to do something. Because if that individual cries out, it could lead to a terrible accusation against a person who could have been of help, but chose not to. This is a very interesting basuk in how he describes length of time. The verse basically says, so that they will fear you as long as the sun shines and the moon endures, generation after generation. So you see how he's describing the length of time as long as the sun and moon endure, as long as the sun shines. It's just an, a way of saying that may his reign last forever, even though nothing is forever, but it's a way of saying that nothing should cut it short. And what should happen? Yira'ucha, as a result of him being a kind king, a God-fearing king that does everything right, he will enable his constituents Yira'ucha to fear you in other words, so that they will fear you and be observant of your laws a lot will depend on the king if he doesn't care and he discourages people like there were some kings who were not very God-fearing unfortunately for all kinds of reasons most of the time politics or because of the idol worship that existed back then they stumbled. You know, if the king stumbled and was a bad example, the people did not follow. Had the king been a good person, an observant individual, he would have had what it takes to convince the people to do something right. The king has the power to do it. And this is also true in a home, one's home. The parents have a certain amount of power, when the children are young at least. It is up to them what kind of an example they lead. If not, the child, in some ways, can blame the parent. Why didn't you tell me? 
Why didn't you say so? You just let me do what I want. There have been stories like that where the kids were really, really upset when they grew up. How come the parents tolerated this? They just let, you know, let me do those things. And because of that, I got into the habit of stealing or cheating or lying or whatever it was. And they regret it. So hopefully the king's example will bring about Yira'ucha, that they will fear you and follow your mitzvot. Pasuk Vav. Actually, before we go to Pasuk Vav, another interpretation of as long as the sun shines and the moon endures could also be referring to those who do things behatmada on a constant level. They do things repeatedly, constantly, you know, was never stopping. Just like the moon and sun do their job constantly, they don't stop. So will the community, so will the people follow your statues continuously without stop. Now he speaks about the Musar, the Tochacha, the rebuke, the teachings of the king, should be upon them like the rain upon cut grass. Gez is cut grass. Kirevivim zarzif aretz, like raindrops that water the earth. Here he's describing two types of hanhagot, two types of conduct that the king has to have. He sometimes has to be strict, like rain that comes down and is beneficial after the, the grass is cut in order for the roots to be healthy and for them to regrow. Or like raindrops, which is a hanhaga raka, as we call it in Hebrew, a soft way of condu conducting himself. There is strict and there is soft. Sometimes you have to be strict. Sometimes you have to be soft. So the king should be able to know how or when to conduct himself in a strict way and how sometimes to just be easygoing and be a little a bit flexible. Sometimes, you know, you just have to be tough. You have to be strict, and this is also true with children. Tough love, they call it. And sometimes you have to be easy. You just, you know, not insist too much, not demand too much, depending on the circumstances. So, if a king is always strict, it's no good. If he's always soft and easy, also no good. You have to apply the two. So here he explains that, or he, I should say, he describes that kind of uh, system as rain, a stronger rain or as soft rain. It was they're both beneficial, but each one is for a different purpose at different times. Yifrach be'yamav tzadik v'rof shalom ad very, very special basuk here. In his days, whether again it's Shalomo or Mashiach, may the righteous flourish with much peace until the moon is no more. Also, very interesting. But a very, 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 very special basuk for the following reason. The rabbis tell us that if you look at the period of Melucha, of rain, until the destruction of the temple, from the beginning of Abraham Avinu, you will find 30 generations. And from Abraham till Shalomo is 15, from Shalomo till the end, till Tzidkiyahu, is another 15. And what does this represent? It represents the crescent of the moon. As it begins to fill up, by the time it's 15 days into the new moon, it's full. It's a full moon. And after that, it begins to diminish. So, Shalomo Melech is the height. Yifrach. Yifrach, as the Pasuk begins over here, is talking about the time when the righteous will flourish. The Jewish people will be at their height. The moon is full. So it's all leading up to that point. After Shalom Melech, unfortunately, if you read the history of the kings, we're seeing it diminishes. Not all the kings were righteous. A few were, but not all of them were. Especially if you look at the northern kingdom. So there's a diminishing of that melucha, 
of the reign of the Jewish nation's height, being at the being at, on the top and coming down and losing the temple, losing the Melucha. And even later on, when they came back and rebuilt the second temple, there was no Jewish king, per se, in the same way that we had in the first temple era. So here we're talking about Ad Beliyareach, until the moon is no more, meaning until the moon, I guess, wanes, right? Is that the word? It wanes, it diminishes, it loses its, its power. There's less and less light. So during the time that it grew, during the time that the moon came to its height on the 15th day, or after 15 generations, at that point, Yifrach Be'yamav Tzadik, Verov Shalom, the righteous will prosper, the righteous will flourish with much peace. It was during his era, during the time of Shalom HaMelech, when there was only peace and there was no war no troubles whatsoever. On the contrary, as he will soon describe, all the kings became friends with Shalom HaMelech, brought him gifts. So this was a, a very beautiful period in Jewish history. All right, next Pasuk. What happened during his time? And again, what is happening during Shalom HaMelech in a greater way will be when Mashiach comes too. But very similar. If you have a Tehillim, you will be able to follow. V'yert mi yamad yam means that he will rule or reign from ocean to ocean, from the river until the ends of the earth. A description of having the most land possible or the most influence reaching out all over the world pretty much. This will be especially so during the time Mashiach comes. Not that he will not be accepted in this country or in that continent. Everywhere, his reign will be miyam adyam, from one ocean to the other, till the end of the earth. The nobles will kneel before him and may his enemies lick the dust. When one reads this, he thinks, okay, you know, the enemy will be subdued. But it's much more than that. We talk about respect. When we use the words, they will lick the dust. What are we saying here? We're saying they will respect him. They will realize his greatness. It's not that they will be subdued and forced. You better listen. You know, I am the one in charge now, the one in power. No. It's much more that they on their own will understand that he is the greatest. So whether we're talking about Shalom Melech or Mashiach, this will be the case, where there will be complete consensus, full agreement that he is the king, or he is the, the greatest king. Some say that because he mentions here the ocean, he's talking about the navy of Shalom Melech or the boats, that he, the commerce that he had reached faraway continents. And we do have a description of the boats of Shlomo Melech coming to the, uh, to the Americas, whether it was North America or South America. According to one explanation, the land of Ophir, from where he brought gold, was Peru in South America. Ophir, Peru. Could be. Either way, we do know that they left from, from where today is Aqaba or Eilat from that port, around that area in the Red Sea. That is where the, could be that the boats left from other ports as well, but that was a port that was used. And the boats went great distances to bring all kinds of merchandise from all over the world. And that is how, of course, na the nations, there was no phone, no fax, no internet. How did they find out about him? So everybody was aware of who Shlomo Melech was, and how knowledgeable, how wise he was. And that, of course, garnered him a tremendous amount of respect. So in speaking about the oceans, he's talking about the great distances that where Shalom Melech's boats reached. And as a result of his reach, Malchei Tarshish ve'iyim min Shivu, Malchei Sheva u'seva eshkar yakrivu. 
Pasuk 10, the kings of Tarshish and the islands will return tribute, and the kings of Sheva and Seba will offer gifts. So here too, this is another Pasuk that describes the relationship that Shalomah Melech will have with other nations, but it adds that they will bring him gifts. Now if you look at the Hebrew, there are two words being used here for gifts. Mincha and Eshkar. Even though some translate Mincha as tribute, it's a little bit different than that. What is the difference between Mincha and Eshkar? In other words, some will bring a Mincha and some will bring an Eshkar. Mincha is also a sacrifice, and so is an Eshkar. It's not necessarily a gift to him personally. It is in recognition of Hashem, especially if we're talking about Mashiach right now, when the non-Jews will want to bring sacrifices, will want to bring something uh, to the Bet HaMikdash, to the Temple. So Minha usually has to do with appeasement. It is to find favor in the eyes of Hashem. It is to seek forgiveness. That is the word, the word Minha is used. To be in good terms with Hashem or with another individual. Whereas Eshkar, it's a very interesting word, you won't find it too often in the Torah. And I was thinking a little bit about it. Isn't it interesting that the word shukran in Arabic, or shukr in Farsi too, means to thank, to praise. Shukrullah, for example, right? It, it, perhaps it comes from this, eshkar, mutashakaram, the same root, to give thanks and to praise. It's not just thanks, it's, it's a thanks of praising Hashem. So this kind of a gift is not so much the seeking to be in good terms, but more than that, to give praise to Hashem. So you have different types of gifts, different types of actions that the nations will take, either when Mashiach comes or if it's talking about Shalom Omer, like either way, in showing their appreciation, in praising Hashem, for example, if you remember the story of Yonah, where the sailors were so impressed by what happened, they saw a miracle, they saw the, the hand of Hashem. It says that they went and they converted. They brought, they brought sacrifices to Hashem. So this is what will happen. I mean, to some extent, this is what will happen during the time of Shalom Melech, where they brought gifts or sacrifices, however you want to look at it, and of course during the time of Mashiach, the same will repeat itself. Next Pasuk is a continuation. All the kings will bow to him, all the nations will serve him. Well, to, during Shalom next time this happened on a small scale too. I, I call it on a small scale because, you know, how long does, does a human being live? How long does this honor last? You know, it lasted only for a short while. He, he lived to the age of 52. But still, he had that kind of kavod, that kind of honor that they, they gave him. They bowed to him. They served him. He had no troubles, no problems. He didn't have to go to war. He didn't have to convince them. They helped him out even in building the Bet HaMikdash. He got help from the north, from Lebanon. But when Mashiach comes, you can rest assured that everyone from one end of the earth to the other. Everyone will bow down to him and everyone will serve him. Because it will be clear to everyone that he is the real king. Rabbis tell us that all the gifts that Yaakov gave to Esav, the nations of the world will bring him back and give it to us. Mm. And more. So, in some ways this fits into what we're saying over here, that they will bring gifts. What for? Yeah, well, <laughs> this is a, a way of paying back for all that they took from us illegally, wrongfully. <laughs> he rescues the needy one who cries out, the poor one who has no one to help him. And then, he pities the impoverished and the needy and saves the souls of the destitute. Number three, 
מתוך ומחמאס יגאל נפשם ויקר דמם בעיניו. He redeems their soul from deception and violence and their blood is precious in his eyes. So, initially what he's saying is that this is the type of a king who will go out of his way to help the poor and the destitute, those who no one cares about, no one worries about. He will be a king who will take care of them. If it's talking about during Mashiach's time, things will, will be taken care of as they never were before. In other words, right now, there seems to be a lot of poor people and a lot of people who are not helped whatsoever, a lot of people who are dying of hunger. Just look at Africa. Even though the United Nations supposedly is sending food, there's so many people who are suffering. So during Mashiach's time, this will not be the case. During Shalom Mohammed's time also, he was prosperous and he used his money to help the needy. To him, that was a, a priority, not as it is with others who don't think of that. Instead, they use their money to buy more arms, more weapons, more missiles. And who suffers? The citizens. And I don't have to mention names of countries. I think you know who I mean. There are various countries like that in the world where a great percentage of the budget is going to the army, even though they have no war. <laughs> just to become stronger and bigger, more powerful. Why not give it to the poor? Why not distribute the wealth in a way where everybody can gain? So this takes a righteous king to do so. That's why he says the words, Yigal Nafsham, he will redeem their soul, because he's talking about it during a time, Mashiach's time, when there will be no more war. So there will be no more violence, there will be no more robbery. So their soul will be redeemed from deception, from violence. He will bring peace. There will be no more war, as the Navi says. This is what we're looking forward to any day now. In the last words, and their blood is precious in his eyes, the rabbis tell us that this is talking about the garment that God wears. On that garment, so to, say, so to speak, that God wears, are all the names of all the Jews who were killed. The, the blood of all those who were killed at the hands of the, of the evildoers. And that will be a time, of course, of revenge. The names are all written. So the blood will be precious to him, precious in his eyes. In other words, there will come a time when there will be an accounting for all that loss of, of life. Next. ויחי ויתן לו מזהב שבע ויתפלל בעדו תמיד כל היום יברכנו. He revives the poor and gives them all the gold of שבע. So, and so the poor pray for him always and bless him all day. Well, it's very good if people like you and bless you and pray for you. As you know, we have a special prayer for the president, we have a special prayer for the leader of the country. As long as he's good. <laughs> I don't think if he's, if he's not good that he deserves that we pray for him. <laughs> but if the king is good and behaving himself, then he deserves our prayer, that he should last, that his enemies should not defeat him, whether it's the elections <laughs> or whether it's some other way. And so that's what he's saying here, that the king will be such an individual, that hopefully people will like him and pray for him and bless him. For he will help them and provide for them with the gold. He will revive them, meaning that he, they will feel very good. Look at history, any book of history, and you will find very few people, very few kings who were really, really uh, sensitive to the plight of the poor and took care of them. The majority didn't care whatsoever. And it's incredible. And I say to myself, why not? Don't you want to have a successful country where people like you? Don't you want to be liked and beloved? You know, it's incredible. You know, there's, even in this country, a lot of presidents who were somewhat productive, I mean, they did do something, but not everybody liked them. You know? And you wonder why. There are some who are very much admired. Abraham Lincoln is admired. Thomas Jefferson is admired, George Washington to an extent, Franklin Roosevelt as well. 
uh, different presidents who were regarded, highly regarded and respected, not so much only for their accomplishments, but for their character. John Adams, president number two, was also a very f fine individual. Uh, James Monroe, even though, I mean, not too many people know about what he did. And I'm not going to mention the ones who are not liked. I don't, I don't like to do that, but there is unfortunately a long list, <laughs> a long list of individuals who are just not well liked, and they have, you know, historians have sometimes a contest on, you know, list who you think was the best president, you know, what does best mean? <laughs> best means that he not only accomplished, not only was he successful, but people really liked him. They thought that he was genuine, he was for real, he cared about them, so people noticed that. So there were, there were a few people here and there, but not too many nice, and I ask, why not? Don't you want people to like you? Don't you want to succeed? Yeah, it's not easy to, to think about the welfare of others. It takes a, a certain amount of, of wisdom, and of course, uh, courage and generosity to carry on, because sometimes a king may want to, but those around him may not let him. That's why I added the word courage, to be strong and not let others influence you. Okay. Yehi pisat bar ba'aretz, berosh harim ir ashka levanon piryov yatsitsu mir keese ba'aretz. This is a little bit difficult to understand, even if you know Hebrew. It contains, however, a very powerful message or description about the future. We're holding verse 16. May there be abundant grain, I'm translating it literally now, in the land. Pisat bar baaretz. Ber osharim, upon the mountaintops. Yirashka Lebanon piryo, may the fruit rustle like the cedars of Lebanon. Viatsitsu mihir keese baaretz. May people blossom from the city like the grass of the earth. What is he talking about? <laughs> this is purely 100% Mashiach time. So let's take it apart. Yehi pisat bar ba'aretz, the rabbis tell us there's several interpretations of these words. The simple one means abundant grain, no lack, prosperity, pisat bar. Pisat also means like the size of one's palm, that you will be able to take a small area, piece of ground, and be able to cultivate that piece of land that it will yield a lot. Now if you want a lot, you have to cultivate acres and acres. But when Shiach comes, things will be so different that even a little bit, you plant a little bit and it will grow into being a lot. Rabbis also tell us that the land of Israel will yield bread and fine clothing by itself meaning that you won't have to work too hard. The bread will just come out from the ground. Today we have to harvest it, grind it, right? Make a dough, bake it. A lot goes into a loaf of bread. When Mashiach comes, even though nature won't necessarily change drastically, as the rabbis tell us, but there will be beracha. And if you look back at Bereshit, you will see that really Hashem wanted it to be like that from the very beginning. It was only after Chet Adam Rishon, after he sinned, that Hashem said, now you have to work hard with the sweat of your brow. You'll have to go in the hot sun and work the fields. <laughs> so when that curse is gone, then everything will be automated. Today we're automating it with machines. So we're getting close to Mashiach. It's already automated. Robots are doing the work for you. <laughs> <laughs> Soon robots are going to drive you. They're already doing that. You see? We're getting a glimpse of the messianic times. But this is nothing. <laughs> it will be a lot better in a grander way when Mashiach comes. So this is a description of that. Beroshanim, he will grow tall to the mountains. It could also mean Beroshanim perhaps even in the hills, even in the high altitudes. It will grow. It's another, it's another way of describing how there will be so much that it will grow everywhere. But how will you get to the top? The trees will swing with the wind 
and the wheat will just come down. <laughs> you won't have to fetch it. You won't have to climb to get it. However, the last few words, that's even more special. Take a guess what it's talking about. And may people blossom from the city like the grass of the earth. <laughs> people will blossom. This will be the time, after Mashiach has already arrived, when the resurrection will begin. They will come out. How do they come out? Someone asked one rabbi. Will they have any clothes on? Yes, they will have clothes on. How do we know? Well, the chita, the wheat, is buried in the ground naked. There's nothing. And it comes out and it's full. A man who is buried with some clothing, with some covering, the more so that he will come out clothed. That's what the rabbi said. In other words, you can understand from this, from the chita, from the wheat that you bury, that you seed, right? How you plant it, it eventually comes out again. Same thing with the man, like a seed. He's planted, he's put it to the ground, eventually they will come out. This, will, of course, will be the greatest miracle of all. I always said that Chiyat Mitim is even more grand than Mashiach's arrival himself, because he's a king, he's a great king. He has tremendous powers. He rebuilds the temple. But Chiyat Mitim, no one ever saw something like that. Will be, dead will rise when you will see your great, great grandparents that you only perhaps know from pictures, if, if at all. <laughs> it will be something incredible. This will happen very soon. Very, very soon. This is all of the scripture of that time. Next Pasuk. Yehi Shemo Le'olam Lifnei Shemesh Yinon Shemo May his name endure forever. May his name be magnified. Yinon. Shemo means to magnify his name. As long as the sun shines. And all the nations will bless themselves by him. And they will praise him. So again, this is about Mashiach. But Yinon is a very interesting word here. Rabbi tells us Mashiach has four names. There was one of the four. Some say his name is Yinon. Some say his name is Menachem. Some say his name is Shiloh, and some say his name is Hanina. Yeah, whichever, <laughs> Mashiach. But Yinon here is one of those names, but here the, the simple translation means magnify, because his name will be magnified yeah, all over the world. And every, all the nations will bless themselves by him. They will realize that he's a blessing for them, and they will praise him. So when he arrives, Everyone will become familiar, everyone will realize that he has come, and this will be a source of blessing for the entire world. The word Yinon, however, the rabbis tell us, also means that for those who are enemies of God, Yinon, he will cause them pain and distress. This Yinon, this individual, or Yinon from the Lashon of Nin, Yanin, means that he is the one that will bring about Triatamitim. It is during his time that this will happen. All of that is insinuated in the name Yinon. The last Pesukim of the chapter, Baruch Adonai Elohim Elohei Israel Oseni Flaot Levado. Blessed is the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone performs wonders. Very important verse, as I said before. Rabbis remind us that Hashem makes miracles all the time, wonders that we're not even aware of. But at that time, look at, the, look at that verse. He says, Baruch Hashem Elohim. Hashem is the attribute of mercy. Elohim is the attribute of justice. There's a reason why he's using the two of them here. He could have just said Baruch Hashem. Or sometimes he uses just Elohim. Here he uses both. That he performs wonders alone. So the simple idea is, there's no one like him. No one else that can reproduce the wonders that he will make, wonders that will be greater than the wonders of, of Egypt when we came out. Wonders and miracles that the world never, has never seen. There's no equal to him. But there's no equal to him also in the way that he performs, that he does acts of chesed and justice at the same time. What's an example of that? Chesed, kindness, and justice at the same time. So there's a beautiful story 
of two businessmen that went out, traveled together, and as they were about to board the ship, one of them had a splinter, a thorn in his foot, which caused him tremendous pain and he couldn't travel, and he was left behind. And his other friend went on to do business. So this one who got a thorn in his foot began to complain and cry and, and it was very, very upset. Why did this happen to me? A couple of days later he heard that the boat capsized and everybody drowned. His tune changed. No more complain. Oh, thank Hashem, Baruch Hashem, that I got that thorn, right? And I didn't travel. You see an example of kindness and justice, the pain, the thorn, but it, it was kindness too, to prevent him from boarding that ship. Baruch Hashem Elohim, the two of them, we will be able to see that then. Now we don't see it. As the rabbi tells, En balanes makir ben iso. Rabbi tells that the one who had a miracle occur to him does not even recognize the miracle. That he missed the plane, but that was, you know, for his own good. We don't always see that good. In the story that I told you, he saw after a few days, he heard. But we don't always get to see. But we should realize that everything is for the good in the end. And that is going to be something very obvious when Mashiach comes. Why will Hashem be blessed then more than ever? Because then, at that point, the rabbis tell us all the terrible decrees will be cancelled. There will be no more poverty, there will be no more war, there will be no more disease, no more yet said Allah and evil inclination. So this will be a time of, of tremendous praise to Hashem. All the sick will be healed. Everybody will have Parnassah livelihoods. This will be a time that everyone will praise, everyone will give thanks to Hashem in a way that was never done before. Therefore, the next Pasuk says, Ubaruch Shem Kevodol Leolam, Vimalech Kevodot Kol Aretz, Amen De Amen. Blessed is His glorious name forever, and may the whole earth be filled with His glory, Amen De Amen. In other words, everyone, not just the Jewish people, all the nations in the world will glorify Him, will worship Him. This will be a time where everyone will be in a full agreement. One religion, one language. This will be a time the rabbis tells that all the prophecies will, will have been fulfilled. Where we will see so much good that we never even realized. Just to end, the last verse, if you look at the last verse, it's very interesting. It says, Kalu tefilot David ben Yishai. The prayers of David, the son of Yishai, are concluded. We still have quite a few chapters left. There's different opinions about whether David Amelech wrote the next chapters or whether he, he, he only wrote it but he asked others to say it or that this really belongs at the very end but for some reason they put it here. Even though this is the way he concludes. In other words, he really wrote everything and said everything but for some reason he chose to write over here that the prayers of David are concluded. Some say, however, that the reason he uses it here, because he's talking about Mashiach, and he's saying at that time the prayers will be concluded, because why, why do we pray? We ask Hashem to intercede on our behalf to help us. At that time it will only be about praising Hashem and thanking Hashem, not a need so much to pray, even though there will be prayers, of course, but in a different way. So, in some ways, at that point, David Amela says, my job is done. <laughs> it will be only about praising Hashem. However, it's important to realize that during this time, up until Mashiach comes, there is a mixture, a mixture of the attributes of mercy and justice, like in the story that I just gave you. And a lot of people misunderstand it. It's important just to clarify this point, why it is like that. And the rabbis explained that the reason is our perception, it's not the reality. It is our perception that is many, many times wrong, that we think that something is bad, that there's severe justice, but it's not. It's all kindness, it's all mercy from Hashem. And there was a story with a great rabbi, a holy man, who was very, very much puzzled. Why, if during his generation, there is Torah, 
there's observance of mitzvot, there's a lot of acts of charity and chesed, and the Jewish people in his community and all over the, the area were observant and were really kind and good. Why still were there so many people suffering in pain, ill, destitute? It shouldn't be like that. Even though Mashiach hasn't come yet, but if everybody was doing everything right, then shouldn't the situation have been better? Shouldn't things have been normal? So he decided on something very, very extreme. He went over to a certain individual who he knew was a very righteous man, and he knew that this man was about to leave this world. And he asked him, please do me a favor. I know you're leaving soon. When you come up there, find out for me why things are not as good as they should be. Come back to me in a dream and tell me why this thing, why it's so. The man passed away and there's no dream. What does he do? He went to the cemetery and <laughs> knocked on the grave and told him, I asked you and you promised me. <laughs> You're going to come back and tell me, please. You know, I'm still waiting for an answer. And he fell asleep there. Sure enough, when he fell asleep, he saw a dream he saw he, of this student, of this individual, telling him, I didn't come to you right away because that which is concealed from human beings cannot be revealed. There's an obvious reason why they conceal it. We can't, we can't just reveal to you the reasons for everything. But let me just tell you the pirush, an interpretation of another pasuk in Tehilim, which already we read already, and you will understand from this interpretation the answer to your question. And that pasuk is diminu elokim hasdecha. That we looked forward to Hashem's kindness. But look carefully at those words. Elohim, chasdecha. We just said that Elohim is justice. How could you say chasdecha right next to Elohim? He's telling him this in the dream. <laughs> Pay attention to this verse. Diminu Elohim, chasdecha. <laughs> chasdecha is right next to Elohim. The meaning looks to, to, to the meaning means to look forward, but the meaning also resembles the word dimayon. And it was in the world of imagination. So he says like this to him, in this world of imagination, human beings imagine that things are bad. But that is not so in the hechal, in the, in the heavens of Hashem. In the heavens, everything is chesed, everything is kindness. So diminu elokim, in other words, in your eyes, down here in the world, it only appears as though something is severe, harsh, painful, but it's not so. Over there it's all tzedek, it's all just. And this is something that we, we've been struggling all along. Everyone has had this question at some point in his life. Moshe Rabbeinu even asked about this. And Hashem says, you cannot fully understand my ways while you're alive. When we get up there, we will understand. And another story with the Ramban, similar story with Nachmanides, he once asked the student who was about to leave this world, you know, when you get up there, you're going to go this place and that place, and you're going to see this and you're going to see that. And when you finally get to this and this gate, you know, I have some questions, you know, <laughs> for, for you to please get back to me. And he, he, this student did comply and come back, and he says, Rabbi, you were right. As soon as I got upstairs, you know, I was well received, and I went from this place to that place, and I saw that exactly what you said. But what about my questions? Says, Rabbi, when you come upstairs, there are no questions. <laughs> Everything is understood. Everything is clear. Here we don't, we don't know. We live, what is 70, 80 years? How much can we know? You know, there's things we know today that we didn't know when we were younger. We understand them a little bit better. When we get upstairs, we will know a lot better. However, we don't have to wait to get upstairs. <laughs> Mashiach will come. We will have a better understanding of why things happened the way they were. Hashem, of course, did everything out of tzedek, out of justice, out of chesed. And he's not like some who claim this is a God of vengeance. And he punishes. Because even the punishment, even the pain and the suffering is all for the good. And when Mashiach comes, we will realize that all the persecutions and everything that happened to the Jewish people was ultimately for, for an ultimate good. For Olam Abba, for the for the world to come. It's not just because, you know, 
Hashem wants to punish because we're bad. Hashem wants to cleanse us and wants to prepare us, wants us to enjoy the afterlife and to enjoy this, the world to come in a way where there's nothing that stands in the way. If we want to have the maximum reward, then we have to make sure that we have no debts, that we leave this world with no debt. And that is, of course, something that only when Mashiach comes, Hashem, we will have complete understanding of. Mm -hmm.